And now, our featured presentation, The Church and the Gates of Hell. Our main text is Matthew chapter 16. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I the Son of Man am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But who? Who say he that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood had not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 19. In this passage, Matthew identified a location for this discourse. He said that they were on the coast of Caesarea Philippi. This is because there were two Caesareas. This town was dedicated to to one of the Roman Caesars, and for this reason it was called Caesarea Philippi. The Romans have a way of changing the names of people, places, and things. So, Jesus was on the coast of the city. He was not yet in the city when he asked the disciples to tell him who people thought he was. In response, they said that some people thought he was John the Baptist, more likely because he was teaching and preaching a new doctrine that also was against Judaism and paganism. Others thought he was Elijah because Malachi prophesied that before the Messiah came and for the Messiah to come, Elijah had to come first. Here are the verses. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. The persons who held the latter view did not know that Elijah already came, and therefore Jesus was the prophesied Messiah. Let us look at two passages. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if he will receive it, this is Elijah, which was to come. He that hath hears to hear, let him hear. Matthew chapter 11, verses 12 to 15. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah truly shall come first and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elijah is come already, and they knew him not would have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise also shall the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Matthew chapter 17, verses 10 to 13. In both passages, Jesus said that John was Elijah. Then there are others who thought that Jesus was Jeremiah. For there are instances where it seems Jeremiah was also used to generally refer to prophets. Still, some thought Jesus was a prophet. Incidentally, when John the Baptist was asked to identify himself, those that wanted the answer had asked, Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. John chapter 1 verse 21. Who then was this mysterious prophet or that prophet? We have to look to Moses for the answer. Here is the passage. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I have commanded him. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. So, who was this prophet? Yes, Jesus. And Luke confirms the answer. Here is the passage. And he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God had spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets, which the world began. 
For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up among you, of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall he hear in all things, whatsoever he shall say unto you. Acts chapter 3, verses 20 and 22. By application, when Jesus asked a question about himself, did you notice that all the answers referred to him as a holy man, a man of God? It therefore means that even when people do not know our names or who we are, they should at least see something of Christ reflecting on us. They should know that we are Christ-like. After hearing the people's views about him, Jesus then asked the disciples, But whom say he that I am? In response, Peter said, You are Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter could have said, You are the Son of God. Because in Jesus' initial question, Jesus asked, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Guided by inspiration, Peter inserted the phrase, Son of the living God. This distinction was necessary because idolatry existed in this Roman province, and further, Roman rulers were also worshipped as gods. Therefore, Jesus is the Son of the living God. After confirming this with Peter, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. We will not pursue a debate if the rock was Peter or not. What we know is, is that Jesus has built his church upon the testimony of Peter that Jesus is the prophesied Messiah. At the time of this confession and Jesus' response, no one knew what a church was. This was the first time since creation that word was used. Jesus created that word to identify those who would accept him as God. These believers would become one in Christ, where there would be no Jew or Gentile, bond or free, male or female, rich or poor, a people who would be Christ-like in thoughts, words, and actions. This church would be built on the rock, Jesus. This church would be given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. This church would need no priest to access heavenly resources. This church would represent heaven on earth because in Christ it would be a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that would show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. After bestowing this authority on the church that would be born after his death, Jesus gave this assurance, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It is clear that the pronoun it is referring to the church that is built on the declaration that Jesus is God. So let us observe a few things about the word church. One, it can be used to identify a dedicated place of assembly for Christians. Two, it could be used to identify a group of people who have been born again in Jesus Christ. And thirdly, it can also be used to identify a faith, a practice, a belief system. The gates of hell can prevail over a place and people, but it cannot prevail over the practice, the faith that is built on Jesus. We should also notice that gates is in the plural form, not singular. Gates, not gate. With this in mind, Gates in this context is more than just a device that opens and closes. Evidence is abundant in the Old Testament, which points to the fact that the term gate is also used to refer to a place where counsel or advice is shared. Let us observe some of these verses. And there came two angels to Sodom at evening, and Lot sat at the gate of Sodom. Genesis chapter 19, verse 1. And Amar and Shechem, his son, came unto the gate of their city and communed with the men of their city. 
Genesis chapter 34, verse 20. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Exodus 32, verse 26. And when Abner was returned to Hebron, Job took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly. 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 27. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is of one of the tribe of Israel. 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 2. In Matthew's context, gate then is synonymous with the evil counsels against the faith that is called Christianity. Those counsels cannot be victorious over the church that is built on the testimony that Jesus is God. Certainly, the physical Christian churches have been destroyed over the years, but the God on whom they are built always raise them up again, in the same place or other locations. Certainly, over the centuries, Christians have become martyrs for the testimony of Jesus the Messiah, the true and living God. They will be raised to life and given rewards at the last day. Can Satan prevail over Christ? Absolutely not. The gates of hell cannot prevail over the faith, the church that is built on Christ. Christians are being killed. Physical buildings are being torn down, but the church will always stand. Christians should never misunderstand or misuse the keys to heaven. The keys of heaven were not designed to open the locks for the gates of hell. The keys to the gates of hell are in the hands of Jesus, not the church. Here is a verse. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Revelation chapter 1 verse 18. Hell is not the church's responsibility. Jesus has the keys to such a place. The church was given the keys to heaven, not hell. Therefore, Christians have no business storming the gates of hell. The church has no business going down to the enemy's camp. That is not the purpose for the keys to heaven. Here in Matthew chapter 16, the keys to the kingdom of heaven were first given to Peter and later to the general church in Matthew chapter 18. In both references, the keys to the kingdom of heaven were for carrying out judiciary purposes on earth on Christ's behalf. It is about binding and loosing, prohibition and permission, about discipline in the church that is built on the testimony that Jesus is the Christ. Let us observe the evidence using some verses from Matthew chapter 18. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him. And if he shall hear, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take two or three more witnesses, that in the mouth of two or three every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever he shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Matthew 18 verses 15 and 18. The passage explains the keys to the kingdom. Let us further unpack it. The offending brother who will not heed the victim's plea for a solution, even with the witnesses and the involvement of the church, would have violated Christ's principle of peace and love. At this time, the church has the authority to bind him or prohibit his rights as a member of the body of Christ. Therefore, whatsoever the church binds on earth is accepted in heaven because the church is the guardian of the faith. In addition, if the brother renews his relationship with Christ, by heeding good counsel, then the church has the authority to loose him or permit him to remain as a part of the body of Christ. Christ said he has given the church the keys, not singular key, but keys, plural. We have full access to heaven, especially when judgment must be made in a disciplinary manner. It is for this reason, Jesus said, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. 
Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. Jesus is in the midst and is assuring the church that he is present even in these times when the church is wrestling for a soul that is going astray. Although the gates of hell are many, none of the keys to heaven was made for the locks of the gates of hell. Jesus has those keys, not the church. Jesus has assured us that he will take care of the gates of hell. The church's responsibility is to focus on the continued spreading of the good news that Jesus is the son of the living God. The church's responsibility is to preserve decency and order in the faith. Let the church be the church because it is built on the rock, Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Thank you for listening.